Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Springfield Township Board of Trustees meeting. It is March 12, 2024, at approximately 5.30 p.m. Uh, Mr. Burning, may we please have the roll call? Yes. Mr. Honolong? Present. Mr. Burning? Present. Do the trustees are present? Um, first thing on our agenda this evening is the Pledge of Allegiance. Would everyone please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> okay. Uh, this evening, we have a, a special presentation. This is a presentation from the Hamlin County Juvenile Court uh, entitled Hillcrest Reimagined. Yes. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Liz Igo, and I'm the court administrator for the Hamilton County Juvenile Court. Um, I appreciate you all giving us an opportunity to be here today. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Um, I'm here on behalf of Judge Bloom and Judge DeGraffenried, the two judges of the Juvenile Court. I brought with me, in case you all have any questions today, Ms. LaDonna Wallace-Smith, who is our court outreach uh, uh, director. I also have Mr. Chris Homeister, who is our chief of security. Uh, Ms. Visible is one of our assistants at the court. And then we have our chief magistrate, Scheherazade Washington. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak to you today about what the court is calling Hillcrest Reimagined. As I'm sure most of you in this room are aware, um, Hillcrest is an entity that is part of the juvenile court continuum of care. It is a facility that sits on Bonham Road within uh, Springfield Township and has been in existence in one form or fashion or another used by the juvenile court and the county to rehabilitate wayward youth since 1914. So for over 100 years, we have existed on that property and we have a great tradition of trying to work with youth within our community. Um, the court, probably in the last 40, 50 years, has operated that property exclusively for the purpose of rehabilitating our delinquent youth. For those who may not be familiar with that term, delinquent is the word that we use in juvenile court for meeting children who have committed a crime in the community. We are um, in the process of accepting, well, excuse me, we have accepted our bids and we are in the process of reviewing bids for service providers who are interested in coming back onto that property. The court had maintained exclusive use of that property and ran it as a court entity until approximately 2011 when unfortunately due to budget constraints we were no longer able to run that as an in-house facility. We accepted bids and in the last 20, 12 years that property has been uh, maintained and run by a private organization. Unfortunately, there were some issues that came to light last year uh, that caused the court and the county to terminate the contract with that service provider, and we have been in the process since that time of um, working to accept new bids for new service providers to come in and run the facilities on behalf of the court, as well as working on rehabilitating the property as there was some significant damage that was left by the previous tenant. We are at this time hoping to be able to reopen that property by the end of this year or the beginning of next year. Um, the reason why the court is here today to speak to you is because we believe to be a good community partner, we have to be transparent with our other community partners about what we're doing and what our plans are. So we're here to answer any questions that you may have this evening. I'm just going to briefly tell you uh, what the court's plans are for the property. So as I mentioned, traditionally this has been run as a facility exclusively for the rehabilitation of, of delinquent youth. However, as a court, um, we have evolved, and as research dictates, we now recognize that the best place to rehabilitate a juvenile when possible is within their own home and the community. So as a court, we do not place children at a rate of 144 children at any given time, which is the capacity out at that Hillcrest property. However, we do have a need for 144 beds for youth across the continuum of what the juvenile court does. So not just exclusively our delinquent youth as we've used this property for in the past. 
We on average place 24 children in residential treatment programs at any given time. So as part of the request for proposal that we submitted to the, uh, the public, we have requested 36 beds for our traditional delinquent youth population for that uh, facility. We are also requesting a 48-bed uh, mental health facility that will help children through crisis stabilization all the way up through long-term treatment. I'm sure as you're all aware, uh, this country is in the middle of a mental health crisis and that crisis extends to the children that we serve. Many of the children that come before our court have significant histories of abuse and trauma and we need an opportunity to give them a chance to heal. So we hope to be able to do that on that beautiful 88 acres um, out on Bonham Road. The last part of the Hillcrest property will be repurposed for what we are calling our respite beds. These are for children who sometimes find themselves in the care of Jobs and Family Services, our, our Child Protective Services Agency. However, um, a little known fact is that oftentimes when children come into care, and the agency does not have sufficient, pro, or sufficient opportunities for placement either in a foster care or a group home, these children end up sleeping in one of two locations. One is at the Children or Jobs and Family Services building downtown at 222 East Central Parkway until appropriate placement can be found. Or if they have uh, minor delinquency charges or perhaps they've run away from a placement that the agency has placed them in, they find their way into our detention facility. Neither of those places are appropriate to treat this segment of the population. These are abused and neglected children and they need a safe place to be rehabilitated and a safe place to stay while Jobs and Family Services has an opportunity to locate an appropriate <coughs> placement for them. So those are children that we will be placing on this property so they can be educated, they can get mental health treatment, they can get uh, an education, and be properly cared for as the agency has time to look for a better structured environment for these children to be placed. In addition to those children who will be utilizing our respite bed, the other part of the respite beds will be used by the court for children who may otherwise um, find themselves running away from home because of conflict within their households. Oftentimes we have children who may be on probation and we're working within the community, but um, as you may guess, anybody who has teenagers know, it can be difficult and it can oftentimes cause conflict in the household. The population that we serve typically has more difficulty and more conflict than an average household and they need an opportunity to have a place to go so they can be separated from their family for a short period of time to get a plan in place to hopefully allow them to go back into their home and reduce that conflict. We're hoping that with the ability to utilize the Hillcrest property in this manner, we can prevent future delinquent behavior and we can prevent children from running away from um, their parents' care and the care of the court. We don't want children out in the community that we're responsible for supervising that we can't locate. So those are the intended purposes for Hillcrest Reimagined. Uh, it's something that the court is very excited about. I will share with you that we have received five proposals for the um, services at Hillcrest, and we are currently in the process in conjunction with the county and Jobs and Family Services reviewing those bids. I'm available for any questions that you may have, um, and if you think of something later that you don't uh, think of at this time and you'd like to ask me, I would be more than happy to receive any phone calls or emails that you may have to ask any questions about the court's intended purpose. I, I know that our Director of Safety Services, uh, Mr. Bly, probably has some questions and or comments related to this. I know he's reached out and spoke to people on your staff and mm -hmm. has attended other various community meetings specific, specifically um, with the city of Wyoming. They have a, a great deal of concerns for their own respective community. Mm -hmm. um, but for us, I, I think speaking for myself and the board, um, and I know uh, Director Bly will, will touch on this, clearly our, our main concern is the service demand that may come as a result of operating that facility in the community and what any sort of burden it may place on our safety services as that facility becomes operational again. And I think um, clearly that's one of our concerns. And in particular, I know Director Bly um, has some, some specific questions. So. 
Yeah, and I think we, we've kind of discussed a little bit informally when we've met and uh, talked to the chief about some of the concerns, I think, moving forward. I think really, it, for the for partly the interest of time, we, we, we need to sit and have a meeting on some of those issues that uh, Mr. Gilbert presented, um, kind of look back historically on what um, services we had provided in, in, that, in those calls down there uh, and in what that's going to look like moving forward. I know we're working with the prosecutor's office on, on how we would deal with the kids that would run away or walk away from the facility, um, whether that runaway is, is looking that that's a, that's a criminal offense and how we would, how we would go about responding to that. And then also if it, there's a possibility, um, I, I was a little confused on when you said there are bids for a, somebody coming in and actually running the facility like the Rites of Passage was doing. Is that what's looking forward in the future? So uh, definitely not. Things okay. did not go well uh, in the past 12 years with rites of passages running the facility without any court oversight. And I think that was the significant error that the court and the county made um, when we entered into that agreement. We will be having a court oversight on that facility regardless of who runs it. We are not providing the actual services to the children, so we are partnering with other agencies to come in. The way that we drafted our request for proposal was that you could bid on all of the components of the uh, property and the request for services that we had, or you could bid on some of them. And we've had a combination of both of those. We have had some service providers who have bid on almost everything, and some providers who have just uh, put bids for certain sections. Um, if I could just address the, the issue with the uh, effect that would have on your services, um, we are willing as a court to work with you however we can to um, make sure that the impact is not significant. I would think just in general, I know that Hillcrest has been there forever. It's only been closed for a very short period of time. It wouldn't have any impact more than it has previously, but we're certainly happy to have any discussions that we can to make the township comfortable with our being there about how we can help ameliorate some yeah, of those and things. And I think specifically, and, and under Director Bly probably was, was hinting at this, is since now it's going to be sort of run by or overseen by the county, mm -hmm. right, as opposed to a private entity like it was the previous 12 years, we feel like the county then should be responsible for the security at the site, um, whether it be the sheriff's office, who, whoever, because obviously from a safety service standpoint, we're already stretched um, here locally. And then to add additional um, burden on top of that uh, for a county facility, um, I think just necessitates yeah. some conversation. And um, I think more specific, I know that there's, there's going to be juvenile court security that we've discussed, um, but when that comes to actual police powers and what we need to do with these juveniles, I think that's the question moving forward. Um, how we go about legally obligations to enter runaways, sign charges if, if, there, if there's crimes down there. I mean, we, previous to, to this, we were averaging between 40 and 50 runs a year down there for various crimes, runaways, and, and assaults, and stuff like that. So I think that's what we would be looking for is, you know, is the sheriff's department capable or able with the county to be able to handle some of that burden of, uh, of the, you know, of the, the criminal activity that takes place down there? And we, as I can't speak for the sheriff, and I can't speak for the county, I can speak for the court. And from the court's perspective, we are more than willing to work with you on any of those things. Uh, we did hear Wyoming loud and clear, and we actually have a meeting with them uh, next Monday as well to discuss their concerns. Part of what we um, discussed when they came and met with us at the court was they expressed a concern that it is a, excuse me, a wide open campus, and it's always been a wide open campus. Um, I took that back to the county architects and I have asked them for a bid at to what it would cost to install fencing around the property, not industrial, not criminal fencing, but residential uh, fencing that fits with the neighborhood, six to eight foot fence is what we're talking about and we are looking at that in conjunction with the county. What we would be hoping to do would be to enclose three quarters of the border of the campus so when children decide to leave, which they will, I'm not going to tell you that there won't be children who run off of that property. That would be um, <laughs> disingenuous if I were to say something like that. Even in a locked facility, you have the possibility of, of people running. 
um, we want to drive them in, in a certain direction, which is towards the front of the building where our security staff will be. The other thing that we heard from Wyoming was they were concerned about the security, and so what we did was we went back to the drawing board, and we have uh, worked in conjunction with the county. The county has agreed to pay for double the amount of security officers that we originally intended to um, secure that property, and my chief can answer questions better about that than I can. So, chief, if you want to come on up and tell them what the plans are for the security of the property. Hello. Um, the, I'm actually old school. I was at Hillcrest when it was county run. I had a staff of five. Uh, we'll have a staff of 20 officers. There'll be five officers per shift. They'll be working 12-hour shifts on rotation, two, three, two, similar to a police schedule. Um, we will work in conjunction. In the past, we had a wonderful working relationship with Springfield Township. Um, I can only attest to what I know. We had the runs a lot less than that when I was there. Uh, we'll strive to get back to that again. Um, five officers per shift, 24-7, uh, 365 days a year. The officers will be spread out on the campus. The, the opening will be structured and segmented. So we'll start with three cottages with five officers. I'll probably have an officer sitting in each cottage waiting for their shift to be over because that's what we'll do. Um, you'll have a dispatcher, similar, sitting up in the, or, or the security building, monitoring cameras. We are looking at a brand new camera system. We intend to use AI cameras, which will help immensely with processing uh, false alarms, uh, we are looking at all the structures of the building and how we will deal with that security-wise. Uh, you have a minimum of three officers in the areas where the officers are, or where the juveniles are being housed. You'll have one up in the building, and the other is the manager, who would be roving as necessary. Okay. Yeah, I, like I said, I appreciate it. I think uh, some conversation Absolutely. moving forward on just on, on tightening things. This isn't something that we're not used to. I mean, it's been, like you said, it's been there 100 years. Um, uh, I think there's just some an opportunity here to, to look at, at bettering it so Absolutely. for the service. Absolutely. And then if you could, just purely from planning, zoning-oriented standpoint, once you get an idea of what kind of fencing you would like to install, please reach out to us just so that we can ensure that um, it's something that we can approve in a, in a more residential setting like that. Because regardless of whether it's county-owned or not, obviously a permit is still going to be required just to install any kind of structure on the property. Thank you, I appreciate yeah. that, and I wouldn't have thought of that, yeah. so I appreciate you bringing it up. I actually have uh, samples, I don't have it with me, but I'd be happy to send you what we're looking at. It's essentially just that wrought iron sort yep. of Fair fence, enough. Yeah, but I'd be happy to share that okay. with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, I appreciate everyone's time. Okay, next, going on with our meeting this evening, the next thing that <clears throat> we have is a public hearing regarding our 2024 permanent appropriations. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Gilbert. Thank you, Mr. Hunterlaw. Uh, it is that time of year again um, where we adopt our permanent appropriations. Um, and I, just like in previous years, you know, I take the 40 plus million dollar budget and try and distill it down into easily absorbable um, sort of ways where um, it one makes sense to everyone and two um, is condensed enough, summarized enough to allow um, us to make decisions on the, on the permanent appropriation. So as we look at the budgetary cycle, um, our, tax, our tax budget really begins our budget season in July. The tax budget, as the board is aware, uh, is that document, is that planning document that we utilize that really sets the tone for um, our budget for the next two years, frankly, because what the tax budget shows is the previous year actuals. It shows the actuals for the first half of the current year. It shows estimated for the second half of the current year, and then it shows estimated for the subsequent year for both revenues and expenditures. Then in September, the county certifies the tax budget. October, they, the township authorizes levies to the auditor, basically essentially asking the auditor to certify that the tax levies that we are proposing are necessary and should be um, continue to be collected throughout the township. In January, we adopt the temporary appropriations, which essentially allows us to operate in the first quarter of the year. And then in March, as we are tonight, we adopt the permanent appropriations. That really is our budget or our appropriation measure, measure and allows us to um, complete expenditures from March to the end of the year. Moving on, if you look at 2023, our overall appropriations um, were just shy of $40 million. 
And then this year, um, like I said, they're just over 40, approximately 43 million. And that is a 9.8% increase uh, from last year. And that is primarily due to increasing grant funding. Um, as the board um, is aware, and I've mentioned uh, many times, unlike um, school districts, the township has capital and operations in the same budget. And when we receive the outside revenue sources, such as uh, no different than in this year where we receive grant funding, that has to be appropriated. So really that difference, that 9.8% increase in the previous year, um, most of it is because of additional grant funding that we have to appropriate and expend in this year that wasn't um, considered received or appropriated in the previous year. When you look at how is our 40 plus million dollar budget broken up in terms of services, clearly fire and police are the lion's share of that. While you look at public works, maybe the first time I think in my 20 year career here where public works um, spending is going to exceed one of the safety services, again, that's primarily because of grant funding. So that public works funding that you see there, most of that is grant funding that is categorized for public works because it is for road resurfacing. Over half, I believe. Yeah, well over half. And then the, and then the general government, there are uh, grant funding in there as well. Um, several million dollars of grant funding that's associated with that category too. When you look at appropriations um, as compared to last year, to, with the respective departments, you see they're all up a little bit. Um, again, as I said, because a lot of it is capital or, or grant funding. But as in most years, like last year, we generally only spend between 75 to 82% of what's appropriated. And last year it was 78%. So while the total budget for the total appropriations was somewhere around 38 million, we actually only expended 78% of that. So approximately 30 million. Looking at the revenue um, over the last six years, you see in the general funds, the difference between last year and this year, that is $1.3 million additional um, in an advance that was recorded in the general fund. Um, generally what happens is when we move money from the general fund to a fund and then we pay it back out of that fund, it shows up as a revenue and we had $1.3 million in advance coming back to the general fund, so that's the difference there. Generally, revenues stay flat, as you can tell. In police and fire, you see that dip um, between 19 and 20. That's when we actually approved the levy in November of 20. We approved new two and a half mil levies in both police and fire in November of 20, which is where you see the increase in revenue um, there. But overall, um, outside of those, revenue stays flat. <clears throat> which will be illustrated as we get to the projections toward the end of this presentation and why that's important to, to realize. Looking at infrastructure spending, this is one that I'm, I'm particularly proud of and, and we should be a, as a community. Um, over the last 10 years, you see here in green, that's the township funding portion, but the total investment in any of those given years is in, in blue. Over the last 10 years, that category of blue, meaning total infrastructure spending, is in excess of $30 million in the last 10 years. But in that same time frame, 16.5 million of that came from outside revenue sources and grants. So we were able to complete over $30 million of infrastructure spending with less than half of that coming from township funding, which I think is pretty incredible and probably not a lot of communities can say that. That paved probably approximately 150, 160 streets. Um, probably close to 30, 35, 40 lane miles of road. Um, and that's a lot when, when you look at a community that has 400, 100, 400 streets and we're on, we were on a 40 year repaving cycle. Um, we were able to make a lot of headway in the last 10 years. And um, fortunately, I don't see that slowing down but unfortunately that obviously creates a lot of work for us as staff. But um, this year we're gonna pave another 15 streets and $5 million in roads. 
Um, 1.2 million of that coming from township and another you know 3.8 in grant funding. So again, uh, we continue to make uh, a lot of a lot of headway in, in that way in that regard. Looking at projections, um, the green line is total revenue. The purple line is expenditures, and you can see that spike um, this year. Again, that's grant funding. And any increase in revenue you really see is related to grant funding. And you can see the corresponding expenditures follow that because we're taking that in as a grant and we're spending it as a grant in that given year. But for the most part, revenue stays flat. The general fund, um, again, you can see that what we really look for in this graph is to make sure that those lines stay as far apart as possible because once they get close, that means your revenues are starting to um, – not keep up with expenditures, and that's a situation that obviously isn't sustainable. So as you see here, I'm um, starting to get closer. Um, as you look at 25, 26, that's something we need to um, be mindful of, and primarily that's related to infrastructure spending out of the general fund. Um, so we just have to make sure that um, we're watching that as we go forward and preventing um, the expenditures exceeding revenues um, too often because then we'll deplete our carryover. Looking at the police district fund, um, again, the same philosophy here. Um, we passed that levy in November of 20. It looks like we're going to be able to extend that levy out to probably 27, 28, um, which I think is good. When you look at fire, however, because of demands on staffing as well as capital and, and equipment, um, we're not looking as is great and additionally we have one mil um, five hundred sixty one thousand dollars in revenue that's going to sunset and come off um, in 27 so that's going to exacerbate this situation you can see where those two lines cross um, that tells me that we may have enough money to operate into 25 but if we don't do something to decrease expenditures or increase revenue we're not going to have the necessary funding to operate at the current level in 26. That isn't, un, that isn't unsurprising because we knew when we passed the levy in November 20 that that was probably going to last five years, which it shows that it will. But the board's going to have to make a decision. Do we go out for a levy this year or next year? I think that decision really comes down to as simple as thinking, that is it, if it does not pass in November of, of this year, and it doesn't pass in 25. We have problems. We have problems. We're not going to be able to operate into 26 unless there's a substantial um, transfer of money from the general fund to the fire district, which obviously if we do that, then that impacts a lot of other um, things such as infrastructure, parks, general government administration. So um, I think the capital needs, the staffing needs, with that being exacerbated by that one mil or that little more than a half million dollars in revenue that's going to come off in 27, um, we're going to have to continue to look at what we do this year um, if we run a levy this year or not. So what do we look at and, and what are the things where you take this multi-page document in this binder that the board gets with 40 plus million dollar budget is the biggest things we need to think about again as we just talked about is the sustainability of the fire district and the question of a fire levy infrastructure spending and looking at the general fund um, again just like in every year is dictated by jed's revenue um, which has stayed pretty steady right around three million dollars a year hasn't really increased or or dipped down too much but unless we continue to increase that jed's revenue um, the current pace of spending out of the general fund to match even the grants that we've been receiving for infrastructure is not sustainable and then, again, um, in the general fund, to keep the general fund solvent, we're going to have to reduce infrastructure spending or increase revenue. And the only way to do that primarily is through the JEDS um, and economic development that undoubtedly we've been successful in over the last few years. But it's still not keeping pace with the need for infrastructure spending. So, again, um, nothing surprising, nothing new. Uh, however, the same issues persist. We're just going to have to keep mindful of them and then as you look at the projections you know these projections while they look concerning they are very conservative 
So these show actuals from previous years, but going forward, it's very conservative in terms of um, expected revenue as well as expenditures. So as you've seen in previous slides that we spend between 75 and 82 percent of appropriations, last year was 78 percent. That's an aggregated percentage that isn't, you know, probably doesn't carry true on every particular fund. But our projections show that we spend 90 percent of appropriations and that we're very um, conservative in terms of our expected revenue. I, I fully expect next year that the projections will look a little better because they normally do, and we do this intentionally so that we're never caught off guard and that we're never in a situation where um, we're in an unexpected crisis. But um, it is a good you know, tool to look at the future and say, what are things that we should be paying attention to? And Chris, I would say that's the right approach. You know, We don't want to be caught off guard. Uh, we go through this every year. We see these projections, and they are, they can be concerning, but usually then by the end of the year you say, well, we didn't spend as much, you know, some more money came in that we didn't account for, we didn't spend as much, and it looks better. And But that's the kind of, that's the philosophy we've had of, you know, running the government to be as, you know, frugal and, and uh, fiscally responsible as we can. Yeah, I never want to be in a situation where we're caught flat-footed and, 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 you know, we don't have a lot of time to course correct. Exactly. So budgeting the way we do and looking at the projections in, in the manner that we do, it gives us a lot of time to know what's coming and to take actionable steps to prevent um, something we refer to in the insurance. I, I serve on an insurance board. Something we refer to in the insurance world as a probability of ruin where you, you become insolvent. And Laura is very familiar with that term. That's something that we never want to do here, and that's why these projections are, are so necessary. The probability of ruin, that doesn't <laughs> sound good. It isn't good. good. But this is exactly why we do what we do to prevent that from ever happening. So, again, I know that was quick, and I know that's a very quick summary of what can be a very complicated budget, but again, um, try to hit the highlights, try to distill it down into sort of consumable bites, if you will. So unless there are any questions, that would conclude my, my presentation. And the board has copies of the, um, the entire binder showing all of the detailed budget um, notations. And while there's no action required tonight, um, the board um, will be looking to take action on the permanent appropriations at the work session at the end of the month. Thank you, Chris. We, we appreciate this. You do an incredible job, you and all the, the department staff, in distilling an incredible amount of information into this budget. And, uh, you know, we've had chances to go through it. It's a lot of it is pretty much non discretionary. I mean, they're just, they're the expense. I mean, they are to an extent. If we were like saying we're going to slash services to residents and we're going to quit doing this and quit right. doing that, but, you know, uh, to have the kind of community that we want to have build the future for, for this place, you know, a lot of it is. It's required. It's in order to maintain the level of service. It absolutely yeah, is yeah, required. It is. Um, but thank you. That was for yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a it's a lot of work. Staff puts in a lot of time. So yes. uh, you know, they they get a lot of the credit. They they put a lot of time in um, to get us to this point. Very clear, and that's that really does boil down all the the big picture of what the budget looks like. Right. No, I mean, we went over it, obviously, at our last work session and met about it and went through line by line, and it's, like Joe said, it's just not very, there's not a lot of discretionary spending other than you know, road improvements and parks and such, things like that that need to be fixed. That's right. basically where we are these days. There's not a lot of discretionary funding. Yeah. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank so, you, Mr. Gilbert. So the only thing I would, before we, you know, move on to the rest of the meeting, I would just ask if there's anyone in the public that has any questions or comments regarding the 2024 permanent appropriations. Is there anyone that has any questions or comments? No. Uh, let the record reflect there is not. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Gilbert. That was very informative. Next, uh, moving on with our agenda this evening, we have approval of minutes from our regular session of February 13th, 2024, and our regular work session of February 27th, 2004. Do we have a motion? So moved. Seconded. Mr. Bernie? Aye. Mr. Hanlaw? Aye. 
Motion carries. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Dan Burney, do we have the fiscal officer's report? Yes, Mr. Hanelaw, for the month ending February 29th, 2024, the township expenditures were $3,146,865.46. And receipts were one million two hundred seventy-three thousand seven hundred thirty-four dollars and thirty-four cents. The ending cash balance of twenty-three million six hundred eleven thousand five hundred fifty-three dollars and eighty-nine cents includes obligations for expenditures, payroll, regular operating costs, ongoing capital improvements, projects, and investments. What I request from the board is the approval of receipts, warrants, payroll expenditures update and current revenue reports for the period ending February 29th, 2024. Do I have a motion? So moved. Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. And I want everyone to know that financial records are available during regular business hours here at the administration offices and on our website 24-7. Thank you, Mr. Hanalong. Thank you, Mr. Burning. Moving on now to uh, departmental action discussion items. Mr. Gilbert, do we have the Township Administrator's report? Yes, and uh, for the first four items, I'm going to turn that over to Assistant Administrator Kathleen Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Gilbert. <clears throat> um, the first item on the uh, agenda for board consideration is the uh, temporary expansion of the Grove Event Center's uh, liquor license. Uh, pursuant to House Bill 669, um, entities are permitted to temporarily expand their liquor license to additional areas, maybe one of the few positive outcomes of the COVID pandemic. Um, in your uh, packet for this evening, you can see the area outlined uh, that's being requested for the temporary expansion of the liquor permit. It's essentially the field behind us. Um, we have many summer events and things back there where we would like to permit people to have uh, spiritus liquor or uh, alcoholic beverages. So uh, annually we just submit that request to the Ohio Division of Liquor Control. So just requesting a motion to um, make that application for a temporary expansion. We need a motion. Yes, please. So moved. Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Haven't we already been serving alcohol in that area? The request has to be submitted annually. So we'll be doing it every year. The Ohio Division of Liquor Control apparently also doesn't define what is temporary. So we just do it for the remainder of the year. Uh, Kathleen, does that, in looking at the map there, does that include the area behind the uh, art center where we have concerts? I believe it's already covered under the it's existing already permit. The other yeah. permit. Okay. Yeah. I thought so. I'd seen it there. Okay. Um, the next item uh, for the board's consideration is the um, appointment of an alternative member, an alternate member to the Board of Zoning Appeals. Uh, the Ohio Revised Code uh, allows for five members of a Board of Zoning Appeals, but then you can also appoint, the board can also choose to appoint two alternates to the Board of Zoning Appeals. Um, as you're aware, the five members of the Board of Zoning Appeals are all volunteers. They're not paid for uh, their time on the township's board, and they probably meet, I'm going to say on average, 10 times a year. <clears throat> it has come up recently due to just scheduling conflicts and people are busy with social appointments and families that um, getting a quorum can sometimes be difficult. You know, I have to have three Board of Zoning Appeals members present to have a meeting. Um, so I would like to request the board to consider appointing an alternate member to the Board of Zoning Appeals. Um, and I'm actually requesting the appointment of uh, Weston Floro Hageman, who you may remember was our uh, co-op from UC last summer. He's a township resident and um, a planning student. He's continuing his master's program this semester uh, in planning. He has a strong interest in the Board of Zoning Appeals and his time here during his co-op, he really enjoyed those meetings. Um, so I am requesting that the board appoint Mr. Weston Floro Hageman as a alternate member to the Board of Zoning Appeals uh, for a five-year term, which is uh, the term of all of our other Board of Zoning Appeals members. 
Do we have a motion? So moved. Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Continuing on the development services show, the next is um, setting the date and time of public hearings for the townships uh, 2024 through 2026 uh, community development block grant application. Um, so as you may recall, every three years, the township um, applies to Hamilton County, which administers the community development block grant funds. Um, we uh, submitted application for various projects that we would conduct over those three years. Um, and in order to uh, participate in that program, because it is HUD funded, uh, we're required to hold two public hearings um, as a part of that application. Uh, they have to be held, I think, a week apart, and our applications are due April 30th, so it's sort of a quick turnaround for us. Um, I am requesting that we hold those public hearings as a part of our um, regular meeting on April 9th at 5.30 p.m. That first public hearing is to consider any um, public comment or ideas that people may have for those funds, um, just to hear any ideas that people may have on application ideas. And then the second hearing I would request we hold as a part of the work session on April 23rd at eight o'clock in the morning. Um, at that hearing, we would uh, discuss the township's intended applications for that three-year funding cycle. So just requesting a motion to set the date and time of those two required public hearings, the first for April 9th at 5.30, and the second for April 23rd at 8 a.m. We have a motion. So moved. Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Um, the last item that I would uh, like the board to consider this evening is um, an agreement that we received this morning from Hamilton County uh, regarding the stormwater infrastructure grant. Um, Mr. Gilbert mentioned earlier in his presentation that the township's gonna be receiving a number of grants um, which have to be reflected in our appropriations, one of which the township submitted an application to the county for their stormwater infrastructure grant. And we were successful in that application. Um, we'll be receiving $850,000 in order to study, um, develop a master plan, and construct at least one portion of uh, some kind of solution to the flooding in the Caldwell area related to Silly Creek, the Mill Creek, and Congress Run. Um, so again, we just received this agreement this morning. Um, Ms. Abrams was then sent the agreement, so this would be pending final legal review for uh, Mr. Gilbert to uh, enter into the agreement. Well, that, that's good news because that has been a chronic flooding problem. That's an industrial part of the township. Uh, we have businesses down there. I mean, this is something that's been going on since I've been on Forever. this board. Yeah. And, you know, we were close at one point with a proposed solution. Mm -hmm. One, as Laura can probably remember, one property owner Hold refused, out. held out, and it's, it's, it's long overdue. If we can get some relief to the property owners down there, that would be great. Yeah, it's, um, it's as you stated, Mr. Hunterlaw, it's affecting a number of our industrial businesses in that area. Unfortunately, we've already had one business um, decide to leave that area because of the continued flooding. Um, I'm hoping to prevent any more. Okay, so. do we have a motion? So moved. Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Motion carries. The next action item is regarding the police department and the body warm cameras. Um, in order to fully implement uh, the body cameras, the township needed a policy to govern their use. So I would just ask uh, Director Bly and uh, Law Director Laura Abrams to um, kind of walk us through what this policy um, involves. All right, I'll do that. Um, it's. Uh, Basically what we needed is a policy that established when we can use it, when we can't use it, how we're going to retain the footage. Uh, that, that's been the impediment to many jurisdictions. It's just the amount of space you need to save uh, body-worn camera footage from 
a department as large as ours is the financial obligation can be crippling. So we want to make sure we're retaining what we need to retain and frankly recording what we need to record. So that's what the um, policy is designed to do is set the guidelines for the officers, provide for training, provide for when we can use it and when we can't use it. Um, obviously, you know, it can only be used for uh, law enforcement purposes and for purposes dealing with administration and training. Um, and, and just trying to figure out how we're going to handle the public records aspect of it. Uh, the records retention schedule, which the Records Commission uh, passed prior to this meeting, had to be updated to include how we're going to handle the, the various recordings and data for the body-worn camera. So it's, it's a lot of policy uh, matters that you have to figure out. Um, the police department uh, command staff did a great job putting it together. Uh, I always tell them they do 90% and then I got to do the 10% to, to tweak it a little bit. So that's what we did. I, I think at this point we have a really good start to the policy. These policies just evolve. So this board will expect to see this on a pretty regular basis for amendments to this as we uh, things come up and we say, ah, we can tweak this a little bit and make that a little more clear or just frankly make it a little better. So I think ongoing we're going to be making changes. I know the command staff and I would talk today about they need to keep a list and as soon as we see something that's not working the way we need to work it, we'll fix it. But as to the plan, we're going to kind of ease this in and sort of beta testing. Um, and then yeah, I think the plan is uh, this is the last step. We're, we're logistically ready with all the equipment that we purchased over the last the last year, uh, receiving state grants that'll that'll uh, actually allow us to pay for that equipment, even the updates for the next five years, um, outside of the personnel uh, that, that Ms. Abrams talked about of the redaction and the public records request. Uh, that's going to be something that we. we that we're trying to prepare for with uh, with our personnel, but yeah, we're looking to kind of ease into that as far as the uh, the um, implementation of the cameras out into the public, making sure we you know we did have a community meeting um, late last year, and informing the public that we're going to be out there, making sure all the, all of our departments and employees know that they will be out there and uh, and see how that goes, and then we'll finish up the training with the with the entire department, hopefully within a month, and we'll we'll have them all up and running. So we just would need a motion to adopt. Do we have a motion to adopt? So moved. Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Mo motion carries. Thank you. Moving on to the personnel update. We've been very busy in fire. And as I mentioned during the budget presentation, we had and continue to have staffing issues with part time in, in fire, but we have made some headway in that regard in the last month, hiring uh, a contingent of part-time EMT firefighters, starting with uh, Carson Curtis, Grayson Hilton, <coughs> Kayla Vincent, Foster Imbrogno, and how do you pronounce it? Imbrano. That's my, sorry, that's my cousin's son. Oh, good. That's your what? My cousin's son. So oh, okay. Imbrano. Yeah. Noah Kurtner, Brett Cole, Bram Uber, Brandon Weil, Ryan Stinger, um, Joseph Hartry, Ethan Campbell. And then we had the hiring of Jody Schenkel? Schenkel. 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 As administrative assistant in the Public Works Department. What just happened to Jane Smith? <laughs> That concludes our personnel update. Now I'll turn it over to Kim for community events and programs. Thank you. Um, this weekend, Arts Connect is hosting its annual mom prom event, which is sold out. Our next event coming up is a children's theater production um, through our all kids theater program. Um, and they're gonna be performing Jungle Book over at the Finneytown Performing Arts Center. We have 37 kids that will be in the show, um, and that is gonna be April 19th and 20th. Um, and then we are preparing right now for the Artisan Fair. That is gonna be on May 18th. We have 60 booths. Um, final letters to all the artists will go out this Friday. Um, we're gonna have entertainment every two hours. A different band will be performing, and it's always a really great event. Kim, what was the date of the Artisan's Fair? May 18th, and it goes from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. 
at the art center? It's actually outdoors on that field, okay. uh, right out there. So we can pray for we'll pray for good weather. It seems like it's always that street. last hour that gets us. We've been on a lucky streak lately. <laughs> on the last year, the last hour was. Yeah, the last hour of the last two. The, we've only had it for two years, and that last hour, every single time, we've had to cut it short. So we're hoping to be able to get the whole show in this year. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Kim. Thank you. Well, unless there are any, the board has copies of the departmental activity reports, so unless you have any questions regarding those, that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Gilbert. Next, we'll move on to resolutions this evening. The first one is a long one. Resolution number 21, 2024, determining necessity for road improvements pursuant to revised code 5573.01 on John Quill Lane, Elm Tree, Elm Tree Avenue, Redbird Drive, Blue Jay Drive, Thunderbird Drive, John Fred Court, Pelican Drive, Mockingbird Lane, Hempstead Drive to cross County Highway, Constance Lane, Fallbrook Lane, east of Deerhorn Drive, Fullerton Drive, east of Deerhorn Drive, Forrester Drive, west of Elkwood Drive, Elkwood Drive, north of Deerhorn Drive, Fellsmere Lane, and Freestone Court in authorizing statutory actions required for such improvements. Do we have a motion? So moved. Seconded. Mr. Burney? Aye. Mr. Hanala? Aye. Resolution carries. Next is resolution number 22, 2024, declaring motor vehicles located on public or private property in Springfield Township, Hamilton County, Ohio, to be junk motor vehicles pursuant to revised code 505.173 and ordering the removal of such vehicles pursuant to resolution number 80, 2012 and revised code 505.871. Do we have a motion? So moved. Seconded. Mr. Burning. Aye. Mr. Hanala? Aye. Resolution carries. Next, we have resolution number 23, 2024, declaring nuisances pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 505.87 at various listed properties within Springfield Township and authorizing statutory actions necessary to abate the nuisances. Do we have a motion? So moved. Seconded. Mr. Burning. Aye. Mr. Hanala? Aye. Resolution carries. And finally, we have resolution number 24, 2024, establishing assessment for abatement of nuisance and certifying the same to the Hamilton County Auditor. Do we have a motion? So moved. Seconded. Mr. Burney? Aye. Mr. Hanala? Aye. Resolution carries. Thank you. Um, then we come to the uh, portion of our agenda for old business. Do we have any old business before the board today? I do not. Uh, any new business? Nope. Um, so, yeah, we come then to citizens' participation. Is there anyone here that would like to address the board? Um, if there is, we'd ask that you come to the podium, state your name and address. Hello again, I'm Charlene Myers, and um, I work out of uh, uh, the Greek Orthodox Church, Holy Trinity, St. Nicholas, 7000 Winton Avenue. Uh, we have a meal coming up, our last meal. Um, I guess I shouldn't announce this over the airwaves, but I did have COVID, <laughs> so first time, and so it knocked me for a loop, so we didn't, we weren't able to invite everybody that we wanted to invite, but um, this next time is March 26th, barring any <laughs> catastrophe, <laughs> and uh, we hope to to ha see uh, police and fire there as a presence, and we've re-invited uh, WCPO to come out, so hopefully, and I did ask our baker if we could make baklava. I'm not promising. <laughs> But we also decided to make things easier, and uh, anybody who wants these, um, we're putting um, all of this information that's on this fancy flyer uh, that corporate makes for me <laughs> to these business cards and to hand out to anybody that you see that's in need. So um, if uh, I've given Rick um, um, 
a stack of business cards, uh, but anybody that el else that wants a stack of business cards can have them to just hand out to anybody in need. Uh, we're interested in increasing our numbers. Um, so far, we've seen about 15 clients come in, yet we see about 60 clients come into our food pantry each month. We do have a food pantry every Wednesday that we welcome people to shop once a month at. So um, again, whatever you could do to help us get the word out, we welcome people to come to the community meal. So thank you. Charlie, what time is? The, oh, good uh, question. It's uh, five to six. It's five to seven. Five to seven. Five to seven p.m. Yes. And uh, okay. And it's March twenty-sixth. This yes. next time. Okay. Very All right. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yes, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Sandra Presley. I'm the Senior Branch Manager of the North Central Branch Library. Our address is um, 1110-9 Hamilton Avenue, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45231. Um, I am here to give a couple of announcements about some fun things that are happening um, at branches nearby. So the first one I'll start with, the Forest Park Branch. By time the summer of 2024, so the summer, they will be opening their new location. Um, very, very excited. And um, with that, their, their address will change to um, 660 Northern Boulevard. And um, they will have 26,440 square feet um, for customers to roam about and check out materials, as well as meeting spaces. And also, they will have 100 parking spots. So um, I don't know if you've seen the parking lot now. It's a little bit on the longer side, not very accessible for someone who might have a chair or um, have limitations. So um, you'll have plenty of places to park and the branch will be fully accessible. Um, so be on the lookout for an invite um, to their grand opening. Um, I've already informed the manager at that location that I attend these meetings and given him access to your email addresses. So be on the lookout for that. Um, also with the Forest Park branch, we are doing throughout the system um, lots of um, social services programming. So they have the 513 relief bus there this past month and also partner with the CET gospel screening at Word of Deliverance. Um, or actually, sorry, the Word of Deliverance, that's March 23rd. Um, with the 513 bus relief, I've been able to witness um, just the sense of relief that people um, are able to get when they go turn in all their paperwork and then they know that they'll have services, whether it be food assistance, um, cash assistance, or health care. They're able to get all of that in a one-stop shop on the 513 relief bus. It's a wonderful program. Um, that we uh, were able to partner with. The um, other thing is with the College Hill branch, um, they have the quick quick relief, um, sorry, the QRT team. And basically what they do is they have resources where um, if somebody's struggling with addiction or struggling um, with finding um, help, they get them the resources that they need. They are sitting in the branch. And um, I've also witnessed them in a previous branch that I was in where somebody was struggling and they were able to get them the resources that they needed um, and make sure that they were safely able to get where they needed to go. So it's a great program. Um, we have them throughout our branches and you can visit our website to find out where they are. Um, they also supply people with Narcan um, in the event that you're around somebody who needs that life-saving measure, we um, at the library aren't able to give those types of things, but the QRT team can do that. Um, so they have the capability of doing those things. Uh, the other thing is in June 22nd, the College Hill um, branch will have a health fair by the Hawksworth um, Blood Bank. 
So be on the lookout for an update about that as well. And something that I'm really excited to announce is that um, the College Hill branch was able to donate 475 books to the College Hill Fundamental Academy, all because we somehow ordered too many books last year, and we were able to gift them to um, the College Hill Fundamental Academy. So now um, they have books that the kids can take home, enjoy in the classrooms, and pretty much do as they please with them. So that made me very, very happy that um, youth will have access to reading materials and kind of do what our mission is. We're trying to develop lifelong learners. And um, last but not least, I will um, chat a little bit about my branch, which is the North Central branch. Um, we have the eclipse party coming up, so everybody knows about the solar eclipse that's coming up on Monday, April 8th. So it'll be 1.30 to 4.30. We will have eclipse glasses. Um, pretty much all the branches are doing it, but you can look at the specific locations on our website, and you're able to get the glasses, view the eclipse, and do activities while you're at the branch. So I invite everybody to come out um, and enjoy the eclipse. Uh, 2017 was the last one, and I was at the Dull High branch, and there were people everywhere. So come early <laughs> to make sure you can get glasses. But I can say that we have amazing customers because I saw many of them sharing their glasses so everybody could experience the eclipse. So I'm hoping to see moments like that this year as well. Um, two more things. We created a Lego club. So Sunday, April 21st, um, parents and their kids um, will be able to come in and experience the Lego club. It's geared towards ages 5 to 12, but I used to be a children's librarian, and I always told people the library doesn't card. Um, so if you are into Legos, definitely stop by the North Central branch um, Sunday from 2 to 3, um, April 21st. That way you can share your love of Legos with uh, the kiddos. And the last thing that I'm very excited to announce is we will have Ella, our therapy dog, um, at the branch every Tuesday from 4 to 5. And um, it's for a program called Tales to Tales. So the kids get to develop their reading skills by reading to Ella. And um, I'm just I'm so excited to see how the kids respond to her. She's a cute little um, pup. And um, I'm just hoping that we get more kids who are wanting to learn to read. And we have librarians there who um, are trained or training to learn the science of reading. That way we can share some of our wisdom with parents and give them some tips and tricks as well as give them access to our collection. That was a mouthful. If you have any questions, let me know. And um, I thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else that has any anything? Um, with that, it appears there is not. Uh, do we have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for coming. Yeah.